This is recording three for Project Echo. Hello, my name is Ryland Mercer, and I'm the owner of Mercer Mechanics here in Neo City 11. I'm continuing with work towards the main division of the original Mecha Contest, or the OMC. The competition may be fierce, but I have no doubt that Echo, the elite covert hybrid operative, will distinguish itself. I do have a new recording setup today, so let me know what you think. I'm not here to win. I'm here to prove a point. That true progress doesn't come from playing it safe, but from taking risks. For me, one of those risks is building out a jetpack system for Echo. The testbed from the last recording will help along the way, but I haven't attempted to create a system like this before. The entire goal is to make the jetpack mutually exclusive from the rest of the mech frame, including its own onboard power and computational systems. This can add complexity to the build, but maintenance and implementation should be faster and easier. The nuclear pack I initially designed can be reconfigured to house the wiring internally within the jetpack, eliminating the need for exposed cables at the top. Although it eventually worked, using a quick connection didn't improve the functionality and only complicated the build. If anyone is interested in trying something like this, I would recommend just using a direct wired circuit. After soldering in the ports and welding them to the nuclear pack housing, a slot was cut into the rearward facing side to feed power directly into the nuclear thrusters. The thruster frame needed a matching slot, which was created using an ultrasonic cutter. After making room for internal components, the thruster walls were reinforced with a photonic polymerization matrix. At this point, the jetpack was ready to have blue wave photon drive emitters connected to the nuclear pack. Don't forget to use plasma arc insulation sleeves before testing to avoid unnecessary doses of gamma radiation. This is where the quick connection came back to bite me. I thought it would be convenient in case I had to perform maintenance inside of the nuclear pack, but I ended up wasting time trying to solder these obnoxious joints. I must have burnt out one of the blue wave emitters when fusing on the insulation sleeves because it didn't work and it needed to be replaced. Treading on the fully machined nozzles, along with a quick test of the emitters, proved to be quite promising for the design. The quantum-resistant polyalloy making up the thruster shells doesn't weld at all, so fiberglass was epoxied around the outside using cyanoacrylate. No one is interested in experiencing an onboard nuclear explosion, so I got to work creating armor panels to protect the jetpack. More features will be added later, but for now, I think this addition is at a good stopping point. At long last, we delve into the realm of quantitative analysis. After all, would we really be engineering without the precision of fractions and decimals guiding us? The jetpack will allow Echo to take on fast reconnaissance missions, but I wanted a more aggressive option in case of needs in regions of conflict. To be clear, I don't have a gunsmithing permit, 
but obtaining 20 millimeter auto cannons from other vendors across the Mio cities is pretty easy these days. Building a double feed drum magazine for ammunition belts doesn't require a gunsmithing license of any kind, as this is not a gun, so I made an in-house design that could compactly fit within the backpack. The frame itself uses standard fare construction, utilizing techniques such as cold welding and plasma torch cutting. While working on the gun mounts, I noticed something strange and recorded this anomaly of a magnetic latch partially levitating within the shop. Things got even weirder when, out of the blue, this person I'd never seen before showed up, even though I was closed for the night. I didn't catch his name, but he had this air about him, like he knew exactly what was going on. He didn't say much. Heck, I didn't say much. I stared at him. He stared at the magnet. He said something like this wasn't the glitch, that this was part of something far larger, some kind of disturbance from outside of the omniplex. He pulled out some strange device, pushed a few buttons, and the magnet fell to the ground. He said the anomaly has been neutralized, at least for now. And he said my taxes would stay the same? And just like that, he was gone. I was left dumbfounded. I'm still dumbfounded, and I like to think I'm a fairly smart and sane person. The only thing I know for sure is that something strange is happening, and it's only getting started. Meanwhile, I'm falling behind schedule and need to get back to the autokin and backpack construction. Most of the build utilizes techniques and parts I've shown previously, so I hope you don't mind if I don't feel like repeating myself here. Utilizing calculations from earlier, I started work on the ammunition belt, which is something I haven't tried before. I did have to make some minor modifications to the input of the auto cannons so that the new belt would feed in properly. But that's not really gunsmithing, right? Totally legal work here. After machining the feed lips, the auto cannon pack was ready to assemble. The jetpack is cool and all, and I'm not really a fan of violence, but I gotta admit that this backpack is looking fantastic on the mech. In the conclusion of part two, I mentioned that this assembling and reassembling the mech let me find some faults. A sophisticated socket system must be implemented to mitigate the structural deficiency at the torso-pelvic junction. Even with an oversized stack of magnetic latches, the upper body socket is compromised and will not hold a sound connection. The existing pistons work as intended, which motivated me to add some additional shocks to help enhance the torso to pelvis interface. After constructing matching pistons, they were cut down to size to properly fit within the allotted space. Spacers can be made from most materials and significantly aid in placement of additional components. Additional armor cages were built to protect the new joint connecting the pelvis to the additional pistons. Satisfied with the upper body, I began work on the third and last backpack attachment. Communications equipment can get very hot during use, so a large step bit was used to mill out the casing for installation of proper ventilation. The recon pack will have several unique sensors, starting with the long-range multispectral scanner. On the right side, I am attaching an atmospheric and chemical analyzer array to help detect environmental threats. This needed to be riveted together, as hot welding would damage the sensitive equipment, while cold welding could introduce chemical traces that oversaturate the sensors. 
Next, I attached a high-sensitivity GM tube for use with the radiation mapping system. The Recon Pack casing had to be carefully integrated into the back of Echo due to existing heat exhaust ports and other systems. A supplementary conduit was integrated into the exhaust system to facilitate the rerouting of excess thermal energy through the pack, circumventing the complexities of redundant interfacing. The last feature to implement is the high gain antenna array. Integration of multiple antennas allows the pack to serve as a communications and data relay system to ensure continuous contact with command centers or other allied units. A standard supply of hyperconductive ferro alloy can be welded into an array designed to capture a wide range of frequencies. After each subassembly was mounted, the outlet for the heat exhaust could be finalized. Last but not least, the rest of the recon pack casing had to be sealed to prevent dust storm debris from making its way into sensitive equipment. The mounting point between the pack and torso was reinforced to ensure a sturdy connection. With the primary features integrated, the Recom Pack was also done for now. Each of the three backpacks can be independently tested, but Echo needs to be reassembled for integration testing each one. Assembly of the mech is the same as previously shown, although at this time I was reintroduced to the problem with the ankles. Removal of the socket material has made the joints loose, and I'm not sure how to address this deficiency. If anyone has suggestions, I am interested in hearing them. The rest of the joints work as intended and have not given me any additional troubles. Attached to this recording is additional footage of each backpack, so stick around if you want to see them properly mounted to the mech. That's a wrap for this phase of the build. I'm Rye at Merce Mechanics. Keep those gears turning, and until next time, stay inspired. Thank you to those at the Royal Archive for supporting small creators like me. End recording three.